So hello everyone, my name is Rowan Amir. I am a first year cardiology fellow at Johns Hopkins Hospital and I am a Cardi Nerds Academy fellow as well at House Towsing. It is my pleasure to be here today with Dr. Paul Calra, professor in cardiology at Portsmouth Hospital University and the primary investigator for the HIT trial we're discussing, Iron Man. Dr. Kelra, thank you so much for taking the time to be to be here with us. We are all sitting at the edge of our seats waiting to hear more about the results of Iron Man. It seems that since the early 2000s, IV iron has really occupied the spotlight in the world of heart failure after Farrick HF you know, started this cascade of, of trials, um, which all showed you know, improvement in, in, in functional status and quality of life and maybe even reduced hospitalizations in these patients but not really a mortality benefit. So can you please tell us more about what inspired you to lead the Ironman trial and what unanswered questions you're hoping to address? So thank you very much for that introduction. And um, yeah, this is a really interesting and emergingly, emerging field within uh, the management of heart failure. So we were inspired by this, by some of the studies you uh, allude to. So some of the the well, firstly, the, the finding that iron deficiency is very common in patients with heart failure. So if you are talking about ambulatory patients, um, somewhere between 30 to 50% of patients will have iron deficiency. If you look at hospitalized cohorts, maybe up as around three quarters of the population will have iron deficiency. And we know from uh, quite a number of, of studies that iron deficiency is associated with impaired quality of life, reduced exercise capacity, and a higher risk of heart failure, hospitalization, and death for the patients. And something that's important there is that that is irrespective of hemoglobin or the presence of anemia, it appears to be iron deficiency per se. And then as you, you rightly pointed out, there were several relatively small study for the heart failure uh, world where we're used to really big outcome uh, trials and long trials, but the, the FAIR HF uh, trial published in 20, well, 2009, followed by CONFIRM, that showed certainly treating patients out to 24 weeks with intravenous ferric carboxymaltose help patients to feel better and, and, and walk further uh, with, in, with improvements in quality of life. And, and you're right at that stage when we started the trial, um, our main goal was to assess the longer term effects on heart failure, hospitalization and cardiovascular death, but also to establish the longer term safety of intravenous iron in, in, in heart failure. So there, I think dating back to some of the historic iron preparations, there were concerns back to the high molecular weight deck strands. Um, and people have still raised some question marks about, for example, the, the risk of intravenous iron and bacterial infection. So we wanted to prospectively gather information to make sure, well, to, to find out what that um, impact was on the hard endpoints as well as the longer term safety. So, so that sounds very exciting. So, so what is the specific patient population that you were looking at? Was it more of an outpatient versus? Uh, you know, patient population versus a more um, inpatient acute setting. So again, in putting highlight, we started the trial uh, towards the end of 2016. It seems a long time ago now. Um, and at, at that time, so this is an investigator initiated trial. It's funded by the British Heart Foundation, which is a, a charitable body in the UK. Um, and it's been conducted across 70 UK sites. We did get drug and some research uh, costs from Pharma Cosmos, but as a noted in investigator initiated and, and a led study. We wanted to recruit a broad range of, of, of patients. So it was at, at that time, we were building up on the data available to us. So it was an ejection fraction less than or, or equal to 45%. So that would be now heart failure with reduced ejection fraction and some patients with mildly reduced ejection fraction. Um, we recruited patients who were hospitalized and expected to survive to discharge, patients that had had a hospitalization within the last six months, or if they hadn't been hospitalized, had other markers of higher risk, which tends to happen for, 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 for trials to enrich the population, they needed to have elevated uh, NT pro BMP or BMP according to sinus rhythm or atrial fibrillation. 
And we used a, a definition of iron deficiency similar, but not quite the same as the other studies that have gone forward. So we had a transference saturation of less than 20%, a ferritin of less than 100. And then for the exclusion criteria, it was a ferritin of, 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 of a ferritin above 400 would have excluded patients. So if you've got a low TSAT and a high ferritin, it's usually a marker of quite significant other comorbid disease. We, other key exclusion criteria, which you might be, be asking as well, would be a hemoglobin below nine grams per deciliter. We felt that investigators would feel uncomfortable not doing something less than nine. And then um, we had an upper limit of hemoglobin of 13 for women and 14 for men, not because iron deficiency doesn't occur above that, but because it becomes uh, less prevalent. And what we didn't want was a lot of screen failures for the, the, the research teams. And can you tell us more about the time frame for this trial? Because it sounds that it took place in the midst of the COVID pandemic where there was a national lockdown. So how did this all impact the trial and how did you work your way around all that? Yeah, it, it, there are, you set off on these things and, and many hurdles come in your way, but uh, we certainly didn't, weren't expecting the, the pandemic and obviously the, the, the major impacts had across the delivery of healthcare let alone research, but um, the, the background to the trial uh, is, is it's a probe design, important to highlight that. So it's perspective uh, design, but it, it, it's open label so that it's very difficult to conduct a blinded or a mass trial with intravenous iron. It's a dark color. And for every patient visit, you would need a blinded research team and an unblinded research team and then you have the patient putting their arm through a curtain and telling them not to look at what's going into their, to, to their arm. Unfortunately, we did in that fashion because I think we'd have had no chance of carrying on that during COVID when research teams were, were pulled to frontline work and, and sitting in the UK very much around the work around the, the vaccine, great vaccination work that, that, that took forward, was taken forward. Um, we found that certainly during at the end of March 2020, um, we went into our first lockdown in the UK. And at that time point, there was, you know, patients were not permitted to come up for in-person visits. Um, and there were quite prolonged periods of time that they weren't allowed. And then in fact, many didn't want to come up to hospitals, actually, given that the fact that they were would, would have been deemed to be quite a vulnerable group. So you know, our belief is it's in, it impacted the data in that if you're in the intravenous iron, iron arm and stand and, and best possible care, actually you need to be seeing the patients on their four monthly visits, assessing their blood tests and redosing if they're iron deficient. And of course, if you don't see the patients, you can't I identify that. Um, so as, as part of um, our statistical analysis plan, we had a pre-specified COVID sensitivity analysis, and that's very much with guidance from the FDA and the EMA that you should be doing that. And uh, we censored the population that all of those recruited uh, to the end of March 2020, but followed their data to the end of September 2020. And we did that because our findings are very much once you've corrected the iron deficiency, it's a minority of patients that need redosing over the next six, six months. And actually that was 91% of the cohort. So the vast, vast, despite our trial carrying on till um, April, 2022, the vast majority of patients were recruited by March, 2020. All right. And I think that I'm go finally going to ask the question that everyone's waiting for. <laughs> Can you please share what you found at the end of your this incredible trial? Yeah, of course, of course. So um, the primary endpoint, which I've not mentioned, was recurrent or total heart failure hospitalization and cardiovascular death. And the, for those that are less familiar with, with, with trials, the recurrent or total heart failure hospitalization is that if, if a patient comes into hospital, they may have more than one hospitalization. If you've got a treatment that reduces the risk of coming in by a certain period of time, 
or it reduces the risk of a second or third or fourth, then typically that's beneficial for patients and, and becomes beneficial for healthcare. So that's the primary endpoint, delaying the results, coming to you by a little bit more. Uh, what we found was that there was a reduction in the risk. So the rate ratio was 0 0.82. So that's an 18% risk reduction. The p-value, however, was 0 0.07. So just missing the conventional statistical significance. When we look at the COVID analysis, we find that the magnitude of benefit is greater. So the rate ratio was 0.76, so a 24% reduction. And the p-value is significant. So the p-value is less than 0 0.05. All right. Um, so since we started the trial, Another trial of firm AHF was published that looked just at hospitalized patients. Um, and the results were of very similar magnitude, actually, interestingly. And it was, again, that was just overlapped into the pandemic, the primary endpoint, very similar degree of, of magnitude of benefit, p-value just less, ju just missing the, the, the statistical significance, but then the COVID sensitivity analysis, the, 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 the same. It was interesting, we were asked by one of our referees for the manuscript, the, the, the main manuscript, to do additional uh, analysis, looking at patients that were recruited until the end of March 2020, but censored for one year to permit com comparison to the affirm data set, because they were all patients were followed for one year. And it was interesting within that, the rate ratio was 0.66, so a 34% reduction in, in risk with a p-value of 0 0.0111. So um, uh, for the, the secondary endpoints and for the individual components of that, the heart failure, hospitalization, and cardiovascular death, um, that the, the, there were numerically fewer events with ferric derived maltose, which is the intravenous iron that we used in this. So it's a different intravenous iron. So it, it, it gives us more information about this, this area. Um, but of course, we have to look at those with the, the appropriate um, the appropriate light, given the, the, the primary endpoint results. We found that at four months, there was an improvement in quality of life um, with, with intravenous iron, very much in keeping with what the previous trials uh, have, have, have shown. And, and something that we looked at, the safety side of things, so all hospitalizations and all deaths were adjudicated. Um, in blinded fashion, um, and there was no signal of excess risk of, of infection. And, and the, in fact, when you look at the MEDRA uh, serious adverse of events classification, there was no um, signal of any excess events with organ class. But for cardiac events, there was statistically fewer with in, intravenous iron. Long-winded answer. <laughs> Very exciting results, though. So I think the next question would be, how do you think these results are going to affect our clinical practice? Like, how will that translate to our day-to-day -day activities and day-to-day -day practice? Absolutely. I, I mean, as a practicing clinician looking after patients with heart failure, I think the data, um, build, building on the evidence base, it's the totality of evidence that we like to, to, to look at. I think this really adds support to um, correcting iron deficiency. Well, firstly, we've got to look for iron deficiency in patients with heart failure. That, that you know, if we don't look for it, we're not going to uh, um, think about treating it. So we need to, to look robustly uh, and regularly for, for patients, not just at presentation, but perhaps every four, six months when they're having biochemistry um, and renal function checked, uh, look for iron deficiency. And then when presence, I think we've now got good, good data uh, across more than one intravenous iron preparation that uh, treatment not only can improve patient well-being, but we've got increasing data to suggest it benefits patients in terms of hard outcomes, in particular reducing the risk of hospitalization. Um, and I think as doctors, so that we always like to see it appears to be safe, we would we would you know, having data over, a, a, and again, I didn't mention, it's a medium follow-up of 2.7 years, very different to the previous studies that have, have gone before. 
Alrighty. So what do you think the future holds for IV iron in heart failure? Do you think we're going to be seeing more trials, you know, that are following patients for a longer period of time? Or do you think we may be studying the benefits of IV iron in a different patient population? Yeah, so all very good questions. Um, so I think the challenge with a longer duration trial, and I've experienced this in Ironman, um, is that as more evidence unfolds, you find that patients in the usual care arm are, are given intravenous iron, not within the trial, outside of it in their clinical care. So actually, the results I've just described are despite 17%, um, one in six patients in usual care receiving intravenous iron at some point during the trial. So those, those but the, we, we believe that these results have likely diluted the magnitude of benefit because we've under-treated the intravenous iron arm and yet in the standard care arm, one in six patients have had intravenous iron. It's something we're going to look at in a bit more detail with, with further analysis to try and tease out that, that impact. So, but, but that's a challenge when you're delivering longer-term trials, I, 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 th I think, unfortunately. And I think that would be even if that you try and do that in a masked or double-blind fashion, which I think is a real challenge over the longer term. But, I, you know, the, the, the iron that we used, it's a... It's a, it's a we, we use high dose so we can give total body replenishment for most patients with a single dose. Um, I think that's been a really important develop, development. Bringing people back for repeated doses just doesn't work so much in clinical, clinical care. We've, we've got more than one intravenous iron that has shown benefit now. The group of patients that we haven't got um, robust data on is, is patients with heart failure and preserved ejection fraction. So we, it's common in those patients. Of course, we've got few, few tricks up our sleeves in which to treat them. We've now got the SGLT2 inhibitors. So I, th I think that's an, an area that we need to look at in more detail. And there are some studies going forward to that, both in the States, looking at exercise capacity. There's a, there's a study from the, from the Boston groups. And again, in Europe, there's a, a study looking at uh, harder endpoints, but in a smaller study. I should highlight as well um, that there's a, an ongoing study, again, with ferric carboxymaltose called heart Fib, um, run by Adrian Hernandez from the, the, the Duke group. And that, that is uh, looking at around 3,000 patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction followed out two years. So that will provide additional data. And I think hopefully there'll be opportunities for meta-analysis to get you know e e even stronger data one other thing that i think remains a little unclear is whether we can get an even better definition for iron deficiency in, in, in heart failure to identify those most likely to benefit and i suspect the greatest chance of getting that is from an individual patient data meta-analysis well, this has been such a thrilling discussion. Thank you so much once again, Dr. Kalara, for taking the time to be here with us and congratulations on such a phenomenal trial. It's been a pleasure and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to discuss it and a great opportunity to thank all of the Ironman investigators and patients as well for their commitment to the trial through very, very challenging times.